another second. Thanks everybody for joining. Um, turned out to be a nice evening in New York City. Um, all right. All right. Um, yeah, I see the room filling up. Um, good evening and welcome to the New York City of Schools virtual evening lecture series. Uh, tonight, it is my pleasure to be joined by Jillian Steinhauer presenting an honorary man, the trope of the old woman artist. Um, thank you again for joining us. And I want to thank Jillian for taking the time to, to be with us tonight presenting her research. Um, I would also like to recognize that the New York Studio School Evening Lecture Series is generously supported in part by public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council, the Robert Lehman Foundation, and the National Endowment for the Arts. Um, and of course, this programming would not be possible without the many individual contributors, um, some of whom I'm sure are in the audience. So uh, heartfelt thank you from New York Studio School. Um, please do consider making a contribution either during or after tonight's talk by just clicking on the support button on our homepage at www.myss.org and then you just click donate button. Um, thanks everybody. Um, I will introduce Jillian in just one moment. Um, I'm sure we're all familiar with Zoom, but at the bottom of your screen, you'll see the Q&A um, icon. Um, please feel free to uh, enter in a question or a comment at any time during the talk. And we'll leave some time afterwards um, to field the questions. And um, if you don't have a question until the end, that's fine too. And uh, I hope we have a good discussion um, afterwards. All right. Okay. Um, our speaker tonight, Jillian Steinhauer, is a journalist who writes about the politics of art and sometimes comics for publications like the New York Times, New York Magazine, The Nation and the New Republic. She's the recipient of a 2019 Andy Warhol Foundation Arts Writers Grant, and she won the 2014 Best Art Reporting Award from the US chapter of the International Association of Art Critics for her work at Hyperallergic, where she was formerly a senior editor. She is a member of the organizing committee of the Freelance Solidarity Project, which is a division of the National Writers Union. Um, and without further ado, please join me in welcoming Jillian Steinhauer. Hi, thank you. Okay, I want to get some housekeeping things out of the way. Um, first, I want to thank everyone for being here. I, I can't see you, which sucks. So, um, hi <laughs> to the 44 participants who I can't see. But thank you so much for coming. And I wish I could see your faces or your names. Um, Thank you so much to the New York Studio School for having me. I really appreciate it. I'm happy to be here or virtually here. Um, and I also, I would also just like to acknowledge that um, even that I'm giving this lecture from Lenape Hoking, which is the unceded land of Lenape peoples. So I'd like to just pay respect to the Lenape community, their elders past and present and future generations and acknowledge that the New York Studio School and the institutions that I write for, the journalistic institutions, were founded upon the exclusions and erasures of indigenous peoples. So having said that, um, I also wanna encourage people to share reactions and comments in the chat, which I can see. And I want to sort of uh, awkwardly apologize for my um, slides, which I feel like are not the best because I'm not good at slides, because I'm a writer. But okay, without all, now all that preamble aside, I will start the real talk. So let me share my screen. Okay. So um, I'm just having some mouse issues. So give me one second here. Yeah, weird, okay. All right, that's fine. So I'm going to start with some slides. <clears throat> We're gonna look at some slides and I want you to just kind of take them in. All right, here we go. Here's one.
Here's another. Here's another. Can't really get rid of the boxes. Sorry, my mouse has disappeared, so it's hard. All right, we'll just make do. Here's another. So as we look at these, I want you to think, are you seeing things that look similar? Are you seeing some themes emerging? Ah, I want to get rid of these boxes. Sorry, guys, I'm having these technical difficulties. All right, we're just gonna have to have the screen cut off. All right, whatever. All right, anyway. Like I said, are you seeing similarities? Are you seeing things that are themes? If you are, it is what you are seeing. It's the trope of the old woman artist. You've seen it before, even if you didn't realize that that's what you were seeing. And it goes something like this. Introducing Jane Artist, this 80-year-old has been toiling away for decades, overlooked by the establishment, but that didn't phase her. X institution now presents her first institutional solo show or her first retrospective and celebrates her startlingly contemporary looking work. At long last, she's finally getting her due. This story may come in the form of a press release or press or both, but the shape of it is basically always the same. On the surface, this is great, right? It's heartwarming, it's gratifying. We all want people who've been overlooked to finally be recognized. And women, close the gender gap, continue the march toward equality, celebrate these artists' brilliance. Except, can you think about how many articles or press releases you've read like this over the years? When does something that seems like a singular story become possibly more sinister? So there was a point, at least five years ago, when I started to realize how many of these stories I was seeing. At first, they made me, a feminist art critic, happy. But at some point, the repetition started to seem kind of weird. I started to get the feeling that the discovery of old women artists was like a trend or something. Certain galleries seemed to be specializing in overlooked women, whether living or dead, which I found weird and kind of problematic. I wasn't sure what to make of the whole thing. Around that same time, a few other things converged. I was working at Hyperallergic, and while I was there, I edited an essay by the curator Ashton Cooper that was the first piece of writing I've ever read about this trend. It was titled, The Problem of the Overlooked Female Artist, an Argument for Enlivening a Stale Model of Discussion. Ashton's piece was incredibly incisive and insightful, and it gave shape and words to what I had been seeing. She defined this trend and she was critical of it. She wrote, these at long last glorified women are, vaunted, are being vaunted as emblems of inclusion and steps toward gender equality, when in fact, the stories that are being told about them are keeping our understanding of women artists firmly grounded in a safe and schematic narrative. Removing all blame from the white male writers of history, these articles justify the delay of recognition as a matter of taste. Their work just didn't catch on. So this was sort of like a very pivotal moment to, to work on Ashton's essay and realize that I wasn't sort of uh, making things up. This was a real trend. Um, I also began thinking back to other conversations I'd had with old women artists myself. So in 2012, I had been assigned to interview Regina Bogat <clears throat> and I had no idea that I was walking into a fascinating conversation with a woman who had been making art for six decades and who also happened to be Alfred Jensen's widow. The depth of our conversation and the fact that I had never heard of her before, heard of her before I got that assignment and before that day stayed with me. I would also go on very soon to befriend Lorraine O'Grady, and she was on the cusp of a big breakthrough. As we became friends, she shared details about the material reality of her life that surprised me and got me wondering about what it meant in actual concrete terms to have success in your 70s or 80s. 
Those questions dovetailed with an issue of the Artist Institute magazine that came out in 2016. It was devoted to Kara Lee Schneeman. It contained a profile of her by Maggie Nelson. And in the profile, Nelson excerpted a, excerpted a letter that Schneeman had written when she was asked to nominate someone for a MacArthur Genius Grant. The text of that letter was searing and it has remained lodged in my brain for years. So it's cut off and I cannot fix that, but I will read part of the quote. <clears throat> I myself am a failure at raising funds and sustaining my work. As a visiting artist, I can hardly support basic functions. I do not have health insurance, life insurance, storage, or insurance for artworks. I do not have savings, retirement funds, medical plan, investments, bonds, etc. It is impossible to produce the new works I envision. People find it unbelievable that in 30 years, I have sold only two works to museums in the USA. I am not the only woman artist with a distinguished history who has no way to sustain her work nor provide for her future. I'm enclosing a bibliography as well as an exhibition and lecture sheet to clarify this extremely paradoxical history, the punishing facts of this mythic career. Perhaps you will understand that being in dire straits while enduring a fantasy of success and achievement makes it impossible to fulfill your request. Whew. Carolee Schneeman could write. So it became clear to me around this time that my misgivings were not unwarranted. Clearly the story of late in life success was more complicated than it looked from the press releases and the news articles. It was a phenomenon that was worth studying, but life intervened and it was only eight years later when I won a Warhol, I don't know why I said eight, it was only years later, it was not eight. <laughs> when I won a Warhol Arts Writers Grant in 2019, which I received in March, 2020, right as we went into lockdown, that I began to work on the project in earnest. So the first thing I did was make a list of the names of women I could think of who'd been slotted into this category in recent memory. Um, the list was long and it was easy to make, but as I kept adding names, I ran into a series of questions and problems. So what qualified as overlooked and what qualified as success? For example, could I count Faith Ringgold, someone who was quite well known but had never had a proper retrospective in New York and is actually now only having one come January? What about if someone had lots of gallery shows but no major museum ones? Or if they had had a retrospective but only because they had kind of mounted it themselves with the help of the curator and it had traveled to a string of college art museums? Who set these parameters and how were they defined? Also, how should I think about someone like Lorraine O'Grady, who didn't even start making art until she was 40, versus someone like Lynn Hirschman Leeson, who started when she was a teenager? Should there be different expectations for their success? And what about media? Was Hirschman Leeson marginalized because she, was, because she used technology in new media, or because she was a woman, or both? And what about styles? Going back further in time, did Alice Neal not become famous until her 60s because she made figurative work at a time when abstraction dominated or because she was a woman or both? Of course, what about other coexisting factors, perhaps most importantly, race and ethnicity? Were black women marginalized first for being black and second for being women? Is that even quantifiable? Obviously they and other women of color have faced double or triple the obstacles and exclusion as white women. And how did the narrative of someone like Luchita Hurtado fit into this story? When she made paintings for decades, but never really told anyone or tried to show them. How was that different from artists who craved audiences for their work, but couldn't find them? So my first biggest takeaway then was that the idea of the overlooked woman artist was not exactly a myth, but a trope. And that it was being used as a kind of smoothening blanket applied to vastly different circumstances. Knowing that, I started thinking about three big questions that I'm going to talk about tonight. What is the shape of this trope? How, why is it perpetuated? And how can we counter it? I don't have exact or even a remotely comprehensive set of answers, but I will share what I found. And I'm gonna take a quick sip of water. Okay. So the narrative that I laid out in the beginning is the basic form of the trope, if we, it's this. 
This idea that a woman who's been overlooked is now being seen and celebrated. One important element here is the idea of discovery. The woman has been lost for decades and now she is found. So where did we have, I want to bring, here we go. Get the rediscovery treatment, rediscovery, but still discovery, right? So this idea of discovery very much mirrors the way the establishment talks about other marginalized artists, including artists of color. And it also mirrors the way we talk about so-called outsider artists. A curator or an institution discovers them and introduces them to the public. So it's a similar process with the old woman, whether that institution is a gallery or a museum. More generally, word choices are a really important part of how this trope gets perpetuated since it often happens you know, in press and press releases. And I think honestly, that's part of why I'm interested in it because I'm a writer and I'm really interested in words. So the language that often gets used is overlooked or ignored. So if we see here, we have overlooked, we have overlooked again here. So those words get chosen rather than the more honest, marginalized or excluded. It's important too that the language is often passive so that the people or institutions who did the ignoring aren't named or given responsibility for their actions. And in fact, they're now instead celebrating themselves for rescuing these women from obscurity. In this same vein, one kind of trope within the trope is this constant suggestion that these women are ahead of their time, or they're in the wrong place at the wrong time, or the times are finally catching up with them, or it's about time. This isn't exactly a euphemism, and it is true in a way. These women are generally trailblazers, but it also makes for like a strange set of catchphrases that allied so much, because everyone is actually a product of their own time. So what does it really mean to be ahead of one's time? So the more I thought about this, the more I realized that time is doing some very heavy lifting here. One of the pieces I published on the subject over the last year and a half or so is an essay in The Believer. Here we go. So in this essay, I wrote about this question of time and I say, in this context, time means something close to a zeitgeist. And given that this is America, the mainstream moneyed zeitgeist is almost always white, male, straight, able-bodied. By definition, women, especially women of color, never fit into their times because the times are not made for them. Instead of confronting this fact, journalists and critics, especially white ones, tend to explain it away. So when we talk about these women as being out of step with their times, what we mean is that they didn't fit the definition of an artist, whether because of their own identities or because of the kind of work they were making or both. <clears throat> so another important part of this trope is the idea of firsts. The occasion for the story and the discovery has to be some kind of big breakthrough, some first thing. So this often has the effect, I mean, it's often true, right? It is the first retrospective or the first whatever gallery show, but it does often also have the effect of erasing what did come before, the shows that did happen, the important moments that did take place over the years. So one example is that I recently profiled Dinga McCannon, who is 74 and having her first solo show in New York at a commercial gallery. The show is unquestionably important for her and her career, but the gallery originally described it in press materials as her first solo show. Once I started digging into her biography, I realized very quickly that that wasn't true. She hadn't had a lot of solo shows and none had been in commercial galleries, but that didn't mean she hadn't had any. But it was more exciting to gloss over that and say it was her first. And the gallery has since revised its language to say first major solo exhibition, which again is true. And you know they should get some credit for that but it also kind of shows you the way that institutions bend over backwards and contort themselves in order to lay claim to these things and to turn them into firsts. And of course they do, why wouldn't they? It's a way of calling dibs. And more than that, it's a way for the institution to pat themselves on the back for finding this woman. Because if she's a genius, by extension, the people at the institution are also geniuses because they are the ones who found her. 
So I think that this first trope or you know, trend is also important because it provides a way of marking the artist's like official entry into the canon. Ashton Cooper discusses this very well in her essay, the positioning of these women as lost and now found. So first they were toiling away in their basements and now they are showing in the hallowed halls of art. What this means is that they are retrofitted to a model of artistic genius that privileges men. This model calls for the strict separation of the art from the artist and a focus on the work itself, often its formal qualities over any social or political factors that played into its creation. So this is a good time to look back to Linda Nochlin, who in her 1971 landmark essay, Why Have There Been No Great Women Artists wrote this, quote, behind the most sophisticated investigations of great artists, more specifically the art historical monograph, which accepts the notion of the great artist as primary and the social and institutional structures within which he lived and worked as merely secondary influences or background, lurks the golden nugget theory of genius and the free enterprise conception of individual achievement. On this basis, women's lack of major achievement in art may be formulated as a syllogism. If women had the golden nugget of artistic genius, then it would reveal itself, but it has never revealed itself. QED, women do not have the golden nugget of artistic genius. So I would say that we could maybe now update this uh, fallacy to say something like this. Some women do have the golden nugget of artistic genius, but it does not reveal itself until they are past 70. QED, it takes women a literal lifetime as wor of work to be as good as men. <laughs> Obviously, this is not true. But again, drawing on Nochlin, I feel like we're not asking the right questions. The question is not, why did it take these particular women so long to be acknowledged? The question is, why does the mainstream only validate a woman after she has put in a literal lifetime of work? Why does the mainstream treat one woman's lifetime as comparable to, I don't know, 40 years in the life of a man? When I was researching that Believer essay, I stumbled upon a kind of remarkable trio of paintings that I think get at the tangled connections and false equivalencies that are happening here extremely well. So I'm gonna walk you through them. And I regret that Emma Amos is cut off on the end, but again, I cannot find my mouse. So, <laughs> oh, here we go. Yeah, look at that. Okay, that's good. Um, okay, so on the left, right? This is, yeah, you're seeing what I'm seeing. So on the left, we have Alice Neal. In 1980, Alice Neal painted a stunning portrait of herself nude. She's 80 and she's owning her age as well as her authority as an artist. This painting was made six years after Neal had her first retrospective at the Whitney Museum in 1974. At the time, she was 74 years old. In the same year across the Atlantic, Lucian Freud had his first retrospective ever at the Hayward Gallery. He was 52, so 22 years younger than Deal, even though they were both making figurative painting. <clears throat> he also had already represented England in the Venice Biennale decades beforehand. So in 1993, just after he turned 70, Freud painted a portrait of himself nude in the studio. There's no question in my mind that it owes something to Neil's self-portrait. I mean, you can, I don't know, there's just, there's clear, there's a clear through line there to me. The year after Freud in 1994, Emma Amos made a painting titled Work Suit. And in this painting, she is wearing Lucian Freud's photo transferred nude skin. Amos herself was only 57 at the time that she made this but she knew that because of racism and sexism, she would never be able to have the kind of career that Freud had had. In fact, in an interview with Bell Hooks the following year in 1995, Amos said, quote, I think that I've learned, I've had to learn that success is not going to come to me the way it came to the blue chip artists and that only a small number of artists are really successful in the marketplace anyway. And it's not going to be me. 
or if so, it's going to be a late splurge on the order of what happened to Alice Neal, Elizabeth Catlett, or Faith Ringgold. Which of course is what started happening to Amos in recent years, right before she died. I am going to the press preview for her retrospective at the Philadelphia Museum of Art tomorrow. Whew. I truly cannot think of a better demonstration of how differently men and women and white women and black women are treated by institutions and the mainstream art world. These three paintings are like an incredible study to me. So returning to our trope, it's clear that this very basic narrative of a woman being lost and then found leaves out so much. So the question then is why does it get used? The quickest answer is that it's easy. And also because it offers a convenient way to avoid placing blame or taking responsibility. So let's break that down. Oh, hold on. Now I can't change slides. Here we go. As far as I can tell, the trope of the old woman artist gets perpetuated mainly by two types of institutions, art and press. It is not a coincidence that in both industries, the more prestigious or legacy institutions are mainly white, highly commercial operations. I realize this slide is a bit of a stretch, but I felt like I had to, I just had to do it succession for white and highly commercial legacy. Anyway, um, <clears throat> as a journalist, it's possible that I am more understanding of the failures of the press, but in media, I see the trope as largely the product of laziness and bad circumstances more than anything else. Simply put, in my expert opinion, journalism is a hot mess these days. And a large swath of, what's get, of what gets written and published is not especially nuanced or deep. That's because the whole business model has fallen out and no one knows how to make any money or be sustainable. So everyone is doing just as much work or more work for less money. And by everyone, I mean the journalists. So that means you might have to skimp on doing that third interview you wanted to do for your article, or you might just not be given enough space to tell the story properly. Or you might take the shortest, easiest route and just parrot whatever material you get from an art institution in a press release without expanding much on it because you have to write five articles in a day. On top of all that, journalism has a major white man problem. And white men, as we've seen, are the ones by and for whom the tropes are written. They are, and no offense to the white men in the audience here, not generally the ones asking the most critical and complex questions about discrimination. Finally, journalism is very good, or is very often about telling a good compelling story. And I do think that there's a way in which people sometimes think that good stories can't be more complicated or that the old woman trope is in fact a good story because it does have human interest and a happy ending and a sense of redemption. What more could you want, right? So I'm sorry, I'm gonna take a quick water break again. Okay, so that's the media. As for art institutions, I am unfortunately much more critical. Without dismissing the genuinely positive effect that a breakthrough like this can have on an artist and her career, and I'll talk about that more later, but without dismissing that, I do think a lot of this phenomenon is market-driven. Galleries, especially high-level ones, are always looking for new work to sell, but betting on a young artist can be something of a wild card, as well as a more long-term, potentially expensive investment. An old woman is a safe bet in a way, because you're getting decades worth of work, an entire oeuvre, and a lot of it's really good because this person has had decades to become an expert at what they do. If you sign an old woman, practically you've got multiple shows worth of material. At the same time, you don't have to pay as much for that material. You don't have to pay as much as you would for a man's work at that age because not a lot of people have ever heard of this woman. You're doing her a favor as much as she is doing one for you. So Pat Steer talks about this dynamic in Veronica Gonzalez Pena's documentary about her. She says, quote, the art world, it's easier on old women because they feel like you have the artwork they've never seen because they've ignored it. So it's like finding hidden treasure and also bargain prices because they haven't seen it and bought it. The prices are lower. They can get a bargain. They can get high quality for less money than if you were a guy and had been famous for 30 years. 
And I wanna to note too, that Pat Steer's words form the first part of the title for this lecture. In the film, she says, now I'm over 70, so I'm like an honorary man. So <clears throat> importantly, also, if you are an institution and you bring on a marginalized artist who's had minimal press beforehand, you can more easily craft a narrative around that work. You can tell a story about that person's life that will inspire people and will make them maybe want to buy or see said work. I don't mean to sound like a jerk here. <laughs> I don't think it's necessarily such a crass calculation every time and on the part of every gallery or institution. But according to the logic of sexism, which rules the art market as well as the entire world, taking on a woman, woman artist who's doing something unusual in her 30s, 40s, or even 50s is risky and or it's just unsexy. Whereas taking her on when she's in her 70s or 80s and she's wizened is a much more business savvy proposition. And you don't have to worry about sexiness too much at that age. I also want to note that although I'm mainly talking about galleries, I do include museums when I talk about the market. At this point, what major art museums show is very much driven by economics. And for them to take a chance on an underknown woman artist can potentially be a bigger risk because the stakes and resources are higher. It could also just be a really tough sell. I mean, curators are constantly having to sell their shows to the board or whoever's in charge to get approval and get money. And if someone's not, never been heard of, you know, if they're not well known, that's gonna be a tougher sell. It's, it's safer and it's easier to let galleries do the discovering and then be the museum that steps in with a show. And I would like to note that show is usually not going to be as big or as comprehensive as one that would be given to a man. So this came up for me when MoMA reopened. They had a show devoted to Betty Saar for the first time at the time, Betty Sarr was in her 90s, I believe. They had never shown her before. And the show was lovely and it was very smart and scholarly, but it was tiny. It was just a few galleries of prints and some early assemblages. It didn't really have any of her political work. It had like two political pieces. So stepping back even further, <clears throat> one more step back. I think this trope is useful even beyond the market stuff it's useful for the entire mainstream art world and white institutions particularly because it provides an illusion of white male dominated institutions because it provides an illusion of representation and or change. What I mean is if you show a woman, an old woman, other marginalized artist, and you tell a story about how exciting it is that you're showing this artist, you can kind of get out of doing the rest of the work which would be, I don't know, acquiring more work by women and other marginalized people or hiring more women and other marginalized people. Or if you're a gallery, representing them for the bulk of their careers, not just the end and demanding higher prices for their work. Basically, you can focus on singular feel-good stories and exceptions to the rule rather than the rule itself and or structural change. So this was really driven home for me when I was <clears throat> working on the Believer piece um, by a study that was conducted by Artnet News and in other words. It was titled Women's Place in the Art World and the reporters crunched the numbers to figure out if the lip service that had been paid recently to gender equality was actually being manifest in various art world institutions. So predictably and depressingly, the answer was no. So here is the opening to Julia Halperin and Charlotte Burns's piece about museums. Quote, just 11% of all acquisitions and 14% of exhibitions at 26 prominent American museums over the past decade were of work by female artists. According to a joint investigation by In Other Words and Artnet News, a total of 260,470 works have entered those museums permanent collections since 2008 only 29,247 were by women. More troublingly, there have been few advances made, even as museums signal publicly that they are embracing alternative histories and working to expand the canon. The number of works by women acquired did not increase over time. In fact, it peaked a decade ago. These findings challenge one of the most compelling narratives to have emerged within the art world in recent years, that of progressive change, 
with once marginalized artists being granted more equitable representation within our institutions. Our research shows that, at least when it comes to gender parity, this story is a myth. Whew. So that's like extremely depressing and also excellent journalism. Thank you to Julia and Charlotte. So if the story of gender parity is a myth, what is the reality? Like literally everything, I would say the reality is complicated. A lot of what gets erased in the trope of the old woman artist are the actual experiences of the people who are under discussion, the complexity of their lives, the ins and outs of their stories. Some of the questions that I have found myself asking over the years are, how has this newfound success affected these women's lives? How did they support themselves over the years and decades before? Did it feel like they were being excluded or were they not especially interested in mainstream white attention? Did they have families? And if so, how did that affect or shape their lives as artists? There's quite a lot of stories of women who put their careers on hold temporarily to have families. Who was their audience and how did their work evolve and change in response to it? Or did they mostly work in isolation? And if so, why? Who supported them? What were their lives like? And those are just the questions about the conditions surrounding the making of the work, not the work itself, which of course requires a whole additional set of specific questions for each artist. So when I won the grant, when I applied for the grant before COVID hit, I had very grand plans of talking to a lot of women who've been discovered about these things. The pandemic very quickly disrupted my plans. I have not been able to interview as many women as I would like. And even when I have, I haven't always been able to go as deep and mostly I hasn't been in person either. But they know better than anyone else the realities and complexities of their own lives. So when I do talk to them, I try to ask as much as possible. And I've also looked to existing material like that Pat Steer documentary and other interviews to find more answers. Some of what I've found. The success that's being celebrated in this archetypal story about old women artists is on many levels, very real. I wanna make that very clear. So I profiled Dinga McCannon for the New York Times. And when I talked to her, Dinga told me that this breakthrough that she's experiencing now has given her financial security and stability for the first time in her life. Carmen Herrera actually says a similar thing in Alison Clayman's documentary about her. There's a moment where she's sitting in the kitchen and she uh, has a woman helping her make food. And she tells Clayman that she was able to use the money from finally selling her work when she was 100 to hire caretakers for herself so that she doesn't have to move to a nursing home. Another profile I wrote was of Howardina Pindell, also for the New York Times, on the occasion of her recent exhibition at the Shed. For that show, Pendel was able to make a video based on an idea that she'd first had 45 years ago. It was an idea that she originally proposed to do as an installation to AIR, the Feminist Collective, which was mostly white, and they rejected it. So all these years later, her newfound success gave her a chance to make this work that she's had an idea for for almost half a century. At the same time, that these positive things are very real and very positive. What frustrates me sometimes is that the darker side of these situations often gets erased. <clears throat> so another profile I wrote was of Lorraine O'Grady for New York Magazine on the occasion of her recent retrospective at the Brooklyn Museum. When I spoke to O'Grady, she talked about the gratification of finally having a critical audience for her work but she also was very candid about the pain of missing a critical audience for her work all of those years when she was developing her voice. On a much darker note, Emma Amos and Mary Beth Edelson both started to experience revivals of their careers in recent years, but neither of them had a chance to fully appreciate those revivals because both of them had Alzheimer's disease. Amos died in May, 2020, less than a year before her career survey opened at the Georgia Museum of Art. Adelson died this past May, a few years after joining the roster of David Lewis Gallery, 
but before ever having a major museum organized retrospective of her work, which is something that I mentioned in her obituary, which I wrote for the New York Times. And I love this quote by her too at the bottom because she really talks about how the way we single out people and canonize them is so not true to how things were in the feminist movement and they're still not true to how a lot of things are today. Also, Lucita Hurtado. She died in August, 2020, while her first career survey was on view at LACMA. So once again, I turn to Pat Steer, who is very eloquent on these things. In the movie, she sums up the situation by saying, quote, it's hard to embrace being the old woman because after that comes the end. So embracing it emotionally is not easy. To make matters even more complicated, some women I have found are really happy actually to have been left alone for decades. After I reviewed Anne Minnick's recent so solo show at White Columns, which was her fourth New York City solo show in five decades, she emailed me a little note and she said, quote, I have no problem with being relatively anonymous for so many years. It's left me alone to do what I want to do, which is benefiting the work now. Her comments echo what Regina Bogat told me all those years ago. She said, quote, you know a freedom that comes very rarely in your life when you're secure. Somebody is taking care of everything and you can do anything you want. I could go and do all these string paintings and I never cared whether anybody liked them or not. I should add too, that in both cases, my writing and the attention it gave them appears to have done something. Minnick told me in her email that the review was having a happy effect on the show. And I do know also that a commercial gallery, um, a commercial dealer read my in interview with Regina Bogat and picked her up and started representing her, which has led to her having more shows and more attention. So speaking of press, this leads to my next point, which is that one of the problems of being a woman and not just an old woman and also not just a woman, but any marginalized artist is that oftentimes your artwork doesn't get actual proper critical attention. And I found that the sort of trope of the old woman artist, the profile, and this again can happen with other marginalized artists, that, that kind of thing can be done very glossily and kind of surface level, and it substitutes for real criticism. So rather than having critics actually engage with the work, you just get a lot of like personality pieces. So sometimes I have just avoided interviewing artists and, I've, and writing profiles, and instead I've opted to just write reviews. So in the case of Zilia Sanchez's exhibition at, at Museo del Barrio in 2019, I decided that the press release language about the show being her first museum retrospective of a largely unknown artist, it just ended up feeling more like pigeonholing than anything that was useful. So I ignored it and just concentrated on her work. In the case of Lynn Hirschman Leeson's recent survey at the New Museum, I did touch on it briefly because I felt like it was one of those situations where she didn't get enough space at all. And it was part of my critique that she is finally having this moment and it wasn't big enough. So I said the exhibition curated by Margot Norton goes some way towards rectifying her exclusion. It's a strong, smart survey that gives her overdue credit. It also feels limited and sometimes cramped, omitting a lot while squeezing too much into basically a single floor. The show, the show strikes me as akin to a greatest hits album, an excellent introduction for newcomers and a dose of reliable inspiration for those familiar with her work, but not deep enough once you've tuned into her brilliance. So one more thing that I have, I wouldn't say found, but confirmed and thought about in studying this trope is that it is definitely not a new phenomenon. <clears throat> It's been invigorated recently, I think, by the market. And it happens, I think, more on a gallery level now, and there's more hype. But it's obviously been going on for ages. So if you look at the Gorilla Girls 1988 print, The Adventures of Being a Woman Artist, number four, knowing your career might pick up after you're 80. As always, the Gorilla Girls were on it. Um, also, as previously mentioned, Alice Neal is one very archetypal example of the trend of a woman not being accepted until they're older. In her case, it was after she was about 60. So earlier this year, I wrote a very long essay for The Nation about Alice Neal. And it was less directly about this 
trope and this question and how this late success played out in her life. But it was in part about me cutting through all the tropes and myths and Neil's status as a larger than life tragic figure to arrive at a picture of her as an exceedingly contradictory and complicated human. But in my research for that, I, there, I found two quotes of hers that I think illuminate very well and, and quite profoundly the contradictions of making it when you're older. So in her first quote, she said it on the occasion of her 1974 Whitney Museum retrospective. And it's, you can see part of it here, but it's also cut off. She said, the show finally convinced me that I had a perfect right to paint. I had always felt in a sense that I didn't have a right to paint because I had two sons and I had so many things that I should be doing. And here I was painting. After the show, I didn't feel that way anymore. And then the second quote was from a few years later at a Skowhegan party at the Metropolitan Club. She said, quote, if you keep your nose to the grindstone for 50 years, you get to stand on this beautiful carpet at this elegantly stacked party. So all of that said, it can be very hard to stay true to complexity and to try to be rectifying these issues when I'm often writing myself within forms that are themselves tropes of a kind, right? The profile, the newspaper review, these things are very um, standard forms. They have, they, they usually take a set form and they're usually pegged to that exhibition that's being touted as the big first thing. So I'm very much operating within the system and I'm very complicit and I wanna be very clear on that. And I'm not always sure that I get it right. I have tried as much as I can in the space that I have to complicate my stories as much as possible. And I've also just tried to be honest about the exclusion by stating it plainly without euphemisms or allusions to time. I will say it also helps to win a grant, a bunch of money, and to have the occasional editor, like the amazing editor I had at The Believer, who let me write an essay there that had nothing to do with anything. There was no reason for it. There was no exhibition. He just let me write what I wanted. So a few concluding thoughts. Why does any of this matter? It's always the question I ask myself. My career, my, oh God, I don't even know. My over a decade, I don't know, probably almost two decades at this point. You no, know, maybe like 15 year career as an art journalist has been shaped by a push and pull between what I think of as micro and macro views. I believe in the vital importance of structural critique at the same time that I believe in foregrounding people's voices and stories. And I'm constantly trying to figure out how to do both in my work. The trope of the old woman artist is something that seems good and harmless, but I think actually it is harmful because it uses the micro to erase the macro view. It presents as feminist something that is actually sexist. These women deserve every ounce of success and acclaim that they're receiving, but they also deserve better than being flattened into one dimensional characters. They deserve the success and acclaim they're getting now three or four decades ago at least. We can and should celebrate them, but we should also not lose sight of the reasons that we're now being given to do so. As I write in my Believer essay, how can we learn to cheer and protest at the same time? Thanks. Thank you, thank you, Jillian. Um, There's a lot of laughter coming from the audience. You just couldn't hear it. <laughs> um, Yay! So yeah. Um, uh, yeah, so everybody, I see some some questions in the Q and A. If you uh, if you want to, if you have some comments or questions um, you would like Jillian to field, please do put them in the Q and A, and uh, we'll try and get through a few in our time. Um, let's see. Um, I'm just trying to look through all of them really quickly. And Jillian, by the way, the the slides all looked great to us, so. <laughs> yeah, whoops, I wish I had made so many comments about it. I like saw my face cutting off the slides and I was like, oh God, they're just seeing me. But I guess you weren't, which is great. <laughs> um, yeah, no, we could see we could see it exactly how you would want it, I think. Um, there's a couple of comments just coming in. Well, so very interesting. Thank you. And 
Uh, thank you for a fascinating take on such a valuable subject. Um, so let's see, here's a, here's a question from Charlotte. Um, and she says, as, as, a young, as young women artists, how do we effectively upend this trope? How do we fight back? Incredible work, <clears throat> incredible work, by the way, thank you. Aw, oh, thanks. Hi, Charlotte. It's a great question. And I have to say, like, one thing I didn't mention is that when the Believer essay came out, <clears throat> it was like, it was, it was a lot. Like, the response, I got a lot of response from older women who were like, yeah. And then I got a lot of responses from younger women who were like, yeah, <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> um, I mean, how do you push back? I don't know. I... You show your work, you find ways to show it, even if you, even if it's not easy, you control your narrative. I mean, I will say like one thing I didn't get too much into is like different women have always had different, different marginalized people have always had different coping strategies. So someone who comes to mind as being like pretty amazing in this department is Lorraine O'Grady. No one was writing about her work. So she wrote about her work herself and she did an incredible job. And actually Lynn Hirschman Leeson did the same thing. People weren't writing about her work and she anonymously took on the guise of three different critics with three different names and like wrote reviews that mentioned her. <laughs> so like, I mean, ethically as a journalist, I shouldn't tell you to do that. But my point is you should build the narrative around your own work as much as you can. I think if that's something you, you care about, I mean, some artists don't, but I think, you know, trying to be in control and shape it yourself is really important. So I think that's one good way to fight back. And also, as young women, supporting the work of older women, right? Like one thing that came up when I wrote the obituary for Mary Beth Edelson, she started to have a bit of a revival in the 90s after this period in the 80s where she was kind of like an outcast. And she had that revival in part because some young artists, or largely because this, 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 these couple young artists started a DIY gallery and they, she joined it and they started showing her, right? So they kind of did it their own way. and people started seeing her work more and talking more about it. So it was like an artist sort of led revival by younger folks. Um, <clears throat> this, is, uh, this is more of a comment, I think, but Kate says, uh, these are tragic stories. Think of how much more work we would have had from these geniuses if they had been supported when they were younger. Um, what about the women who worked for 40 years and never make it to age 70? or the women who were brilliant but poor and had to stop because of sickness or tra tragedy in middle age. Absolutely, um, no, absolutely. And one thing I didn't get into that much, honestly, or really at all is like class is also an issue. I mean, like if you notice in the Regina Bogat comment, like she had a good life, like Alfred Jensen did really well. And she says like, I, I, he was taking care of everything and I could just make art freely. But obviously that's not the case for a lot of women. So those kinds of circumstances really do shape it as well. And it is tragic. Um, I think uh, I think you kind of answered this in, at the end of your talk. This was a little bit earlier, but Anne says, um, as an aside of your comments, is the term old woman artist yours or a commonly used phrase? I ask because in reading about ageism, I think the preferred term is older woman rather than old woman, since that to me is a term that conjures up a stereotype of old. I'm curious about your thoughts personally at 67, I prefer not to be thought of, not to be thought of as an old woman. This is a great question. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, my language on this has shifted, but you are totally right to point it out and call it out. And I don't know what the answer is because I am only 36. But <clears throat> I will say when I started this project, I framed it as older woman. And then when the Believer essay came out, they used the term old woman. They just like went with it. And I kind of liked it. And I got, I, I got a lot of responses from people who also liked how kind of blunt it was and kind of like not trying to, I don't know, couch or cushion anything. So I kind of adopted that going off of what they did in the Believer, but it is totally fair to raise this question and it's possible that older is better. And I will now think about that more and try to figure it out for next time. So thank you. Um, 
this is a comment and question from Trissy. Um, they say, as a 67 year old woman artist, your words offer a passionate validation to my own and so many other art women artists being invisible eyes. My cynical side says that male artists prefer to swipe women off the art field in, in their younger years, but it's okay to include them once the woman is a crone. In your experience, what would it look like in an art world, an art market, if women artists were no longer erased early in their career path? I mean, I can't speak from experience because it hasn't happened. <laughs> but um, I mean, I think it would just be, it would look more like parody, right? I mean, it would look like women showing all the time and um, women's work being sold for, the, for equal prices as men. And, and I think also, I mean, this is something I didn't even get into and it actually comes up now in a question um, in the chat, um, sort of relatedly. So uh, Rajan, I never know how to say your name and I don't know if I'm saying it correctly, but Rajan asked, would a 67 year old man be referred to as an old man or just as an artist, which is a great question. And I think something that comes up too of this idea of like, what would it look like is, you know, maybe we wouldn't even need to be, or we, we wouldn't even be specifying woman artist at all, right? If there were more parity and women were supported earlier maybe we would all just be artists. I mean, it's like a nice utopian thought um, that we wouldn't have to be. And it's the same thing when you think about gender identity or you know, um, race and ethnicity, right? Like who gets specified and othered and who does not? So I think maybe in an ideal world, no one would or everyone would. To me, it's one or the other. <laughs> Personally, that, that kind of reminds me of Joan Mitchell saying that she, she didn't want to be in a the, the National Women's Museum because she didn't want that label. Yeah, and there's, I mean, this is like a whole nother layer, but there's a lot of women of her generation who really rejected like the term woman artist. Um, and like Alice Neal had a very contentious relationship with the second wave feminist movement, which is something I found, I learned a lot about when I was reading about her. So yeah, this, this is a whole, I, I get why people to, to me, it's important to claim it, but I also understand why people reject it. Um, this question is from Farah. Um, they say, hi, Jillian. Do you feel that the trope feels differently for other artistic professions, such as writing, for instance? Do you also feel that it's mainly a, a US thing or beyond? <sighs> These are great questions. I don't have great answers, but I definitely think the trope extends beyond the art world. I haven't looked at it as much in other arenas, but the re I will say the reason, part of why I think it is so market driven is like, it doesn't seem to play out in quite the same sort of like self-congratulatory spectacular way in other fields. Like art is so tied to the way we write and talk about art is so tied to the market. And these stories kind of feed that. And you just don't have that in literature or in like, I guess you do have it in music. I don't know. I just, I don't see it as much in other fields but I'm also not as much of an expert in other fields but it, it is definitely there. I like, I know it, it definitely exists. Um, and in terms of other countries, I don't really know. I will say something that came up a lot in this research is that a lot of these women have felt more supported in Europe over the years than they have in the US. Um, as just one example, Lynn Hirschman Leeson had a major survey at ZCAM of like a ton of her work, like a major retrospective that was so much bigger and more comprehensive than what she had here. Um, this is uh, from Anonymous. They say, um, <clears throat> this is kind of more of a comment too, but I've never heard of this app. So, but this, she says, or they say, this is more of a comment at this point too. Wow, thanks for the phenomenal and clear talk. I was in Chelsea looking at, at shows last week and had this sinking feeling that much, not much had changed. I did a quick tally from the Seesaw Gallery app on the amount of current solo shows by men versus women. It came to 53 male and 22 women. So a little less than one third women. There is a sense that women should be polite, be grateful for how far we have come when things are nowhere close equal. Yep. 
And I don't know. I don't know what the answer is. Like, I think that having data and tallying is really important. And I've written about that in my career, like Nicole Hebron's project of the gallery tally I wrote about when I was back at Hyperallergic. And of course, like Howardina Pendel did a lot of counting in her day. She like did all these studies of the numbers of galleries and, you know, um, how they were, who the artists they represented and the Gorilla Girls, like there, there's tons of groups that have done it. And I think it's super important, but I guess the question at a certain point becomes what's changing? <laughs> We keep counting and what's changing? Not much. Wow. Um, there's a lot of uh, thank yous coming from the audience. I'm, um, I don't see any more questions. It's super interesting. Thank you. So good to meet you. Thank you for this lecture. And um, Trissy has a comment of, I'm thinking of how Picasso said, any piece of paper he writes on becomes like currency. I'd like to see a woman artist achieve that same artistic and commercial confidence, so. Oh my God, Picasso is like such a can of worms, yes. <laughs> oh. um, well, I, th I think that's it from the audience. Um, so thank you so much, Jillian. Um, this has been a really interesting talk and, um, and I, thanks everyone in the audience for joining and, um, you know, uh, Jillian, if you have any final th thoughts to share. Um, but yeah, thank you. Thank you all so much. <laughs> thank you to the, the New York Studio School and to everyone who came. I really appreciate it. Awesome. All right. Um, have a great night, everybody. And uh, I hope that we see you.